it's, uh, it's great to have a great panel of industry veterans and expertise across a whole bunch of categories, especially in the environment today, where uh, India is at the cusp of the change in discretionary spending from consumers. You know, I think everyone knows the uh, opportunity, but the fact that discretionary spend from consumers is going to, uh, you know, grow from 2.7 trillion to 5 trillion by 2030. It's a massive moment of uh, tapping into consumer spend. Now the question really is how do we as brands and retailers tap into that big consumer opportunity? So it's a very uh, opportune time to uh, discuss this. I think the other context before I actually ask some questions to the panel because that, that's, that's why everyone's here, is the context for the consumer. It's increasingly digital. The consumers are exposed to a lot more stimulus whether online or in the retail environment. They have way more options. There's a lot of clutter. Uh, and that's, that's really the environment uh, that the consumer is in. And as some of my uh, earlier mentors had taught me, that in retail, the three things that matter are location, location, and location. So I wanted to also check as the uh, conversation progresses on what are the other things that really matter. So. Uh, Manish, Samir, Avnish, Sanjay, Jagat, Kamal, Deepak, Subhash, thank you for being on the panel and look forward to a great conversation. So maybe just to kick off the conversation, and I alluded to retail, and perhaps Manish, since you're at the far end of the table, maybe we start with you, uh, but would request the other panelists to come in. Now the consumer is increasingly transacting in several categories uh, through digital mediums. Omnichannel behavior is increasing. They are discovering products, interacting with brands, and transacting in many occasions digitally. So in that context, how important is the store location? Right? Has that importance changed, increased, decreased, or, or you know, just have a store anywhere? <laughs> but would love to get your thoughts and then you know, everyone else. Well, from our experience, uh, what we have seen is that very clearly as in location is the most important thing in terms of when you look at physical retail. And when we talk of location, it's not just about in terms of are you at a prominent location, but also in terms of the vicinities or the adjacencies that you have uh, along with you uh, to have the right sort of consumer walking into your space, whether it is a shopping center or it is a high street. I'll, I'll give you an example in terms of uh, we had this new mall that came up in uh, Hyderabad. One of our partners had signed up a store. Uh, not a bad location, but uh, two months into the opening of the mall, we saw that our shopping shop within a department store was doing 30% more business than our store. And we said, what is it? As in, because ideally we should be doing 3x of what the shopping shop was doing. So we looked at it, we said, we are not in the right vicinity, uh, even though the location is prominent and we probably need a bigger space. Uh, we went back to the shopping center. Thankfully, they agreed there was space available. We mo moved on. Suddenly, as in, we moved 40% bigger space, but we saw 6x revenue growth. So it is about, clearly says, and it was not about that we were, as in we were still in a prominent location. Where we moved, we were in the right vicinity in terms of like-minded brands. So think of it as in, from a brand aspiration point of view, you might say that, okay, I want to be next to a Louis Vuitton because that's how I want to be as in looked at and consumer will come to me. But the reality is that Louis Vuitton is only gonna get four or six walk-ins in a day. Probably you are a brand which needs 100 walk-ins in a day. You are in the wrong location, it might be the best of location, but it's not the right location for you. So I think it's very, very important to not only look at in terms of uh, where you are, but also in the right vicinities. We have done a lot, lot of restructuring even on our retail format uh, uh, pre-COVID and then post-COVID. And there again we have seen, even on a high street, a 50 meter sort of a difference between location and A and location B gives you 2x returns. So, and for us, as in when I look at it, if I look at our retail portfolio today, we have actually, in terms of number of stores, we have gone down by 25%, but my retail revenue has increased by 30%. So, and that's all in terms of saying, 
are you leveraging are you at the right location and are you leveraging that micro market well in terms of saying this is the potential of the micro market and am i doing justice to the consumer so i think those are as in my or our perspective in terms of location uh, it, it it is the most important thing but just don't look at it from a perspective in terms of is it prominent is it right also look at the vicinities in terms of the right sort of consumer who want you want to walk in thanks manish to i love the best location is not equal to best location for you right? so very very insightful i'd love to get other views uh, from the panel if there are uh, good afternoon <coughs> of course as manish said location is the key uh, maybe you sometimes what happens is in the interest of commercial objectives you know what what is your ratio of rental to sale we end up having a location which is probably not the the first priority but believe me the kind of investment you have to do to get the footfall is much much higher than the higher rental you will pay if you are in the right location and then also we will have to see you know one shoe doesn't fit all whether you are a destination store are you a vanilla brand or you are a speciality brand you know these also these factor also define a uh, location is good for you or no and probably the other thing is the format you know every brand has different formats so not all locations suit all formats and when we do analysis of the location it's not just the catchment study it's the relevance also maybe a uh, population is higher age demographic matter but probably their household income doesn't doesn't tie to you so there are a lot of factors but covid or no covid pre covid or post covid location is the key and uh, probably the last thing i would love to share is rental is one of the uh, one of the cost but that's not the only cost so sometime we end up getting into a location or even the size keeping in mind rental being low but believe me rental is just half the cost rest half anywhere remain if your business is less and you have a less rental it's suicidal as compared to rental being high and business being higher and the large box that's another thing which is the new thing and i just wanted to give an example from one of the company i worked in the past for example nike you know it was long time when i was associated with them so they had about 400 stores or rather 450 stores one point they this they decided to shut down 250 stores from 450 to 200 and they opened 100 more but it was a large box it was a store every size of about 3 and 1/2 4000 a bit short of nike town with 300 stores their revenue was 25% more then when they had 450 so it's also the box size because offline is more demanding it's more experiential rather than just you know buying a product so you know these are the factors which also you know are important here no thanks deepak i think just building off what mari shared the right location for you the right format and i, I love the fact that you know don't get greedy you know low rentals and i have seen many of our clients actually getting you know swayed by the fact that it won't take much to open a store your know, rentals are low let's grab that location and then the downside of you know going with that decision is actually way more than the low rental uh, decision so it's a great watch out the se- second watch out i think both of you alluded to is it could be a high traffic location right these are the two biggest considerations at the highest level high traffic low rental let's open a shop but if it's not the right traffic or if it's not the right traffic for the nature of purchase we are talking about and we have you know mobile phones we have fast fashion we have uh, you know all, multiple f- kinds of fashion uh, brands also represented on this panel you know it has to be in sync with the purchase occasion and the journey uh, you know is it weekend versus weekday occasion is it the commercial versus residential uh, so i'm talking about more macro factors at this point but yeah very insightful uh maybe deepak i'll continue with you uh, on a question uh, and you kind of alluded to it but would love to double click a little bit more as you have executed store rollouts you know uh, across a multiple uh, you know organizations that you've been with what are the few learnings and insights that you want to share with the panel and then the group here both in terms of uh, you know uh, experiences or uh, practices that are best practices as well as some challenges or mistakes that you've seen you know either your own organization or uh, others make so uh 
Sure, I'll talk about the mistakes because that, that's the, the best learning ground. So I do remember, which is the case even today, a successful mall and you were late. Yeah? And now you want a space there and you're not getting. What do you want to be there? We said, okay, this was about a decade back. I won't name the mall, but we said, okay, I want to be there. So let's set up a large store just outside the mall opposite. You won't believe it bombed like hell. So anything, this was one of the biggest learning. We spent a lot of money in fit out. We spent a lot of money in doing it up, inventory and all. And it bombed like we never thought. We had to shut the stores in six months. So the learning is, if you have a large, successful mall, don't be anywhere close to it if you can't be inside it. Yeah? So <laughs> you pay more, you throw somebody out from there, you know, collude, conspire, so that somebody closes the store and you get in, but never ever just be opposite or next to it, just thinking there's a lot of traffic and they'll come. They'll get in the mall, they'll not even come out. They'll get to the parking lot and move out. Yeah? That was one of the learning which was a very costly learning. The other learning was, this is maybe a bit different from the location. We had a multi-story store when I was working for a footwear brand. So we had ground in first. And with our history, we were clear that women footwear in our format sells much higher than the men's footwear. So we said, okay, women is 60%, men is 35, 5% is kids. I'm gonna put women footwear on the ground floor. You know what happened? My business became 40%. Because the realization was women need this space. Women doesn't want people moving in and out. And footwear is a category which is engaging. It should, you know, so they want to spend time and they want to have their own space. Men probably doesn't need it. Because the kind of time a, a guy spends on buying a footwear is half the time uh, a woman takes. So it's always good to be on the first floor where they get their own space and they are not bombarded by people moving around. Yeah? So that was another learning. So we had to spend a lot of money to switch it. Business came back. The third thing was, it was a high street. Malls, it's relatively easier. You know, you have zoning, you know, there's a footfall. And if you are a good brand and visibility of your store is good, you're rightly located within the zoning, have a good facade, you will do business. But high street is not easy. You know, most of us fail in high streets. So we saw a market. And that market had five stores selling the our category. And they were doing reasonably well. We decided not to be there. The, the assumption was, it's like oversupply. There are six players, five of them are there. They are doing reasonably well. You just hope, and they are there for, you know, two years, three years, five years, have a set clientele and the loyal, loyal customer base. And we decided not to be there. And we could never get there afterwards. And then when we got there, we realized that was one of the best store ever. Because the consumer consuming that category is coming in hordes there. And you not being there, you are, you are missing something. So these were three mistakes which were very costly and uh, didn't work for us. And probably the first part which you asked, you know, what are the best practices? You know, it de depends on high street is a different animal altogether as compared to mall, as I said. I'll cover mall. You know, probably we drive uh, left, so location has to be on the left side if you want to be, because intuitively, when you enter a mall, you turn towards left and then walk. Yeah, you don't go to the right side. So if you're on the right side, probably, you know, you will have 30% less, less footfall until you go around and have an energy to come back and, and see you. Don't be in the first five store, because by the time you land from the entry, you have missed those five stores. We actually have missed those five stores because they are too closed after entry and you don't, you don't, until unless you have no other work, you just want to go around from one store to another and doing some research, you will actually end up on the fifth or sixth store. And then be in the zone. Don't try to be on the ground floor all the time. If the mall has a good zoning, ground floor doesn't help, you'll end up paying a lot of rentals, a lot more higher rental, and consumer will actually be going to the first floor where your zoning is. Uh, on a high street, of course, it's a bit different. I think you have to do, you have to see, you know, if you are into online, you have to see where your consumers are. 
are they buying in those uh, pin codes? And it's a debatable thing, but I believe if you have a high concentration of your online consumers in a particular pin code, you need to put up a store there. It's not cannibalizing because it will increase both the sales in both the channels because it will bring credibility once you have a store. So these are some of the practices which I feel are good. Super. Uh, I mean, all of them very actionable, Deepa, and I, you know, the left is right is a new insight which I will use. <laughs> you know, I never thought about it. Uh, very, very uh, cool. And, you know, the examples were very uh, insightful. Sabir, you, uh, you know, you're in a very different business from, uh, from everybody here. <laughs> from everyone here. <laughs> but I'm, you know, most used business. <laughs> the majority is apparel guys, eh? so be careful. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, first of all, I'm kind of uh, protected from the so-called digital thing because you can't do a haircut. You have to come to the salon and do your beauty services. So we're kind of safe that way. But having said that, I'll just take up from what uh, Deepak uh, said earlier. And I'll tell you, I've also made my uh, fair bit of mistakes. I've spent about 20 years in the beauty space running uh, large companies like Kaya and JCB and now Looks. You know, and... Uh, there is something which is called FOMO, uh, and I've suffered from that. That if there is a new complex which has opened in Bombay, and why am I not there? And everybody is there, the best restaurants are there, and the best retailers uh, from this panel, and many of you are there, why am I not there? And these are commercial complexes. And I put up a beauty salon, or a clinic, or a spa, and I've burnt money. So. For us, costly learnings, but now that's being recorded in the black book that you don't do anything in commercial complexes. We don't do anything in office complexes. We don't do anything in hotels. Uh, office complexes, I used to run a French company earlier, so, you know, again, the whole experience of Paris where the lady would, after office hours, go have a drink with her girlfriends or with her partners and then would go to a salon, et cetera, et cetera. In India, we thought the same thing would work, but at seven o'clock in BKC, everybody wants to go home. Nobody wants to go to the salon, you know. So those are challenges which we've kind of, uh, uh, and I've made mistakes. Third one, clubs, large catchment. Everybody thought gym khana, premium clubs. A lot of customers will come. Membership is not available. Seventy lakhs, eighty lakhs, a crore of membership. But the mentality of club goers is very different. Uh, they would pay the same prices outside, but. If we have a salon inside the club, they would say, no, we want subsidized prices, even though it's the same brand. So these are some of the learnings which we've had, and this is not, not this all come from experience. And uh, even for such a basic business like uh, hygiene business, like haircuts and beauty businesses for women. So I think these are some things which we've kind of uh, just taken it out from our uh, radar. So whenever we meet uh, real estate, uh, whether they be agents or brokers or promoters or mall developers or et cetera, et cetera. I think some of these three learnings I've just uh, said that, no, please do not approach us if you have any of these formats on offer. Uh, and I think uh, uh, I personally don't have that FOMO anymore. So if somebody is going there and making a very grand salon there from a competitive brand, good luck to him. But I've realized that it will not work for us, you know, honestly. Yeah, I love that, uh, Sabir. Don't open a store because of FOMO, because I've seen many brands doing that. <laughs> you know, competition store network as the benchmark for your store network. Uh, and the second insight, which uh, you know is true actually across a lot of the consumer work we do, that we typically assume value-seeking behavior from with income segments, and that is absolutely incorrect. Right? Value-seeking behavior is present across income segments, uh, and you know very often uh, it's the high-income segments that actually demonstrate higher value-seeking behavior depending upon the context and channel and so on. So very, very interesting. Maybe I'll switch, uh, sorry. I, mean, I just wanna, as in what Samir said, so also in terms of, you have to look at it in terms of the geography that you are operating. So typically as in, like Samir said, there are certain as in office complexes, as in uh, saloons dot work. And I used to manage uh, Australia as a geography for in one of my previous stint. So think of it as in for India, we have seen six to nine is our best shopping period. Australia, it is one, two, three. Because six, actually 5.30, they'll go off, spend time with the family, friends in a pub and then go home and have dinner and everything. So their peak shopping time is one, two, three. And there again, as in if one, two, three, they are in office, the best shopping location is actually next to office complex. So you have to also keep in mind in terms of 
the geography and the sort of shopping behavior that the consumer has. And then secondly, adding up on the whole FOMO thing, I think it's very important because we always see these announcements in terms of saying I want to do 50 stores in a year, 100 stores in a year. I think it's always important to go for quality rather than quantity. Instead of 50, open 35 because a lot of times what happens is that you open 50 and then end up closing 20 of them. So, and there again, the difference is, okay, I want to get this high street or this location. I'm not getting the right location. This is 50 meters off or 20 meters off. I'll open up here. Six months down the line, you realize you have made a mistake. I need to close. So always, rather than as in going on, focusing on quantity, go on quality. I, I agree, uh, Manish. In fact, I was reminded of, a, and I'll give an example from food service, which is a slightly different category. Breakfast is a very big occasion in the Western world for, let's say, McDonald's or many other food service uh, you know, players. In India, breakfast, nobody has breakfast outside, right? And if at all you do, you do in you know, the poha or the ban maska and so on. But the organized quick service breakfast location is non-existent in the country. So the playbooks that exist for global brands you know, are not applicable in the same way in India, just given the consumer behaviors, the locations, the preferences are uh, quite different. Maybe I'll switch to a very different category, right? Everyone uses a mobile phone <laughs> and uh, everyone refreshes mobile phones. So how do you think about store locations? <laughs> Subhash, would love to get First of all, let me introduce myself, Subhash Chandra from Sangeeta Mobiles. It's a family-run, family-owned business. I'm the second generation. My son has just joined the business. Uh, we are a 50-year-old company. So 50 years back, there were no mobile phones. So we started with music. Sangeeta, names com name comes from music. We were selling what today's youngsters call as vinyl records, what I call them as gramophone records. So we come all the way from uh, you know, music to, uh, or rather gramophone to smartphone has been our journey. And uh, Sangeeta today has just short of 800 stores, all company owned, company operated, predominant headquartered at Bangalore, all over there in uh, South India, except Kerala, as of now we are not there in Kerala, but we are also there in Goa and Ahmedabad. So, and uh, uh, there is a lot of learning for me that, you know, left is right. And then uh, ladies prefer first floor, uh, and in Australia, one, two, three works. You know, so many nice things. In fact, that's one of the reasons I make it a point to attend these conferences. Um, okay. And similarly, I think uh, there's probably, you'll be surprised. Uh, we have stores right opposite to each other on a high street. For Sangeeta, I have always felt, or for a mobile store, I have always felt high street works better than uh, malls. More malls I have, uh, mall stores have, have ended up closing. Very few, the success rate is very little in malls for us. And on a high street where, you know, for some reason we have not got the uh, ideal size, let's say. I want uh, minimum 20 feet frontage, but I've got only a 10 feet frontage in a small town. I end up taking it. And subsequently I, I get a store right opposite or just two buildings away. In, in fact, in some cases, it's the same, uh, same landlord also. Um, and we op take that store, hoping that we will close the earlier store. But both stores continue to do well. In fact, I have one town, Zahirabad. It's on the border of Karnataka and Telangana. We have three stores, literally like a triangle. Two opposite to each other and one, uh, two buildings away. And that's my best town in entire uh, Andhra Telangana. So sometimes it is, uh, it, it's a riddle as to, you know, what makes it work. <laughs> and, and, and so there, you know, there's nothing right, there's nothing wrong. And especially because mobile phone as a category is required by everybody. Even uh, the poorest of the poor today needs a smartphone and is using a smartphone. And, uh, in fact, in the smartphone industry, zero interest EMI is default. In fact, if any friend of mine calls me, I know he's asking for discount. But the first thing I tell him is, first thing, okay, I'll give you a discount, but don't pay cash. Don't pay cash or don't swipe full. Go for a 24-month EMI at zero interest. Absolutely zero interest, zero processing fee, zero down payment. 
So what I'm trying to say is, we look at population. In fact, you know, I, I could not have done 800 stores, and especially most of these 800 stores have come, uh, and uh, somebody was mentioning, uh, some, don't go for a number. Yes, there is a learning. Sometimes uh, in the last four or five years, we have been putting up more than 100 stores every year. This year, we have not. This year has been a year of correction. Uh, but in our case, because the smartphone as a category is required by one and all, we look at just the population. Any town that has a 25,000 population, Sangeeta has to be there. So all over Telangana, in fact, we, we are not the number one in Telangana as a, as a brand. As a retail brand, somebody else is number one. But still, we made it a point to go to each and every smallest of the small town. I was the first player to go there. By virtue of going there first, we have acquired the highest market share there. So this has worked for us brilliantly, beautifully. Uh, very interesting, uh, uh, Suvarsh. I think the, there is definitely an element of leading uh, densification, you know, and especially in the Western markets, density of the uh, retail network is way higher uh, for, for most brands compared to uh, India. I think this, this, your storefront being a marketing and a point of sale, I mean, just a footprint really matters. So it's very, very interesting. One more thing I would like to add is, uh, Sangeeta, incidentally, many of you here, because Sangeeta is not there in this part of the country, may not know, India's first mobile retailer, we were. Wow. When only grey market, 99.9% .9 was grey market in the year 96, 97, Sangeeta was India's first retailer to sell a phone with a bill and warranty. So therefore, when we decided to expand, uh, there was no modern trade in 2001. 97 to 2001, we were in one store. And every day, I used to come to open the store. I was a mom and pop store then, right? I used to come to open the store and there used to be 10, 15 people waiting outside the store, waiting for me to open the store. Good old days, the best days. <laughs> okay, from then, so there, we took four years to decide to expand. I had to convince my family because the thought process is, why are you expanding? From there, we have now come to close to 800 stores. So, 1970, I, I just said I am a 50-year-old brand, Sangeeta. So, 1974 to 2001, we had one store. So, 2001 to 2023, we have now, 20, we have close to 800 stores. And all our company-owned stores. Because we were the first ones to go and expand, and because mobile as a category was new, I went to crazy places where there was probably, if you ask me today, I would never go there. We have gone there and opened and everything has been a hit. Very inspiring. I think the category creators do have to have that entrepreneurial, uh, you know, uh, zeal and take, take calls. Uh, couple of uh, follow-on questions and maybe Jagat, I'll ask a question. But after that, Kamal, Avnish would love to hear from you as well on, uh, you know, your experiences. Jagat, as a part of your MasterCard work, I understand that there is a fair bit of data-led analysis and decision-making that you support, uh, you know, uh, people like, uh, you know, our honest, uh, the honorable panelists here. How do you think about, uh, you know, the analytics behind the decisions that uh, brands make on where to open a store? What are the parameters that are important? Which are the ones that are less important? Do share a little bit. Great. Thanks, Ravi. And, uh, you know, for the people who are thinking what MasterCard is doing here, right? Uh, I think one of the one or two data points I would like to throw, we have in India, just in India, we have 90 crore debit cards and we have 10 crore credit cards. Now, what do people do with those 100 crore cards? They go and spend. They spend across all the, you know, brands that you see here and across, you know, outside, they spend and all that data on where they are spending, when they are spending, how they are spending, if they go to a mall, what are the three things or five things, 10 things that where they are spending, all of that resides with us, you know, uh, and that is, you know, the gold mine that we have, where we are trying to get, use analytics and generate insights out of those. Um, you know, a lot of my esteemed panelists talked about experiments or the decisions that they have to take if you're opening a new store, if you're changing the layout of the store, right? 
Now, analytics and those insights is somewhere uh, that is helpful as a key point for each of them to say, okay, we have seen this uh, working. Uh, we can help you see, you know, if an experiment A or B will work or not, right? So if you want to open a store in the first floor or the second floor, if you want to keep a product in aisle X or Y, right? If you want to keep it, you know, right at the front or slightly at the middle, all of that, that, you know, the examples that we spoke about, uh, analytics, uh, we've used analytics to get some of those answers, right? In the context now of, you know, store openings, uh, some of the factors, you know, we spoke about rental, uh, you know, where, what is the catchment area, what kind of uh, people, what kind of seg customer segments will come here. So you need from a, any brand would want to reach out to the right segment, right? And we have data where at almost at a pin code level, we are able to say, okay, you know, you, these are the kind of customer segments you will see. This is their spend patterns. Uh, if you're selling apparel, what else can you, uh, you know, partner with? Uh, what is the kind of, uh, you know, spend or, uh, you know, margins you can have uh, if you're opening a store here, right? So, so those are some of the things that we take. Uh, we have a, you know, set of data scientists who are, um, you know, working day in, day out, uh, running these algorithms, looking at the data, not just from India perspective, uh, but also globally, right? Um, we talked about Indian numbers, but globally we are looking at trillions of transactions and spends going through our network. So we anonymize that data and get insights, get segments that work for you, right? Uh, and that is what is valuable for each of the, you know, um, retail partners that we have. Um, you know, we have also looked at, I, I think store network is one of the aspects, uh, we have also looked at, you know, where within the store should, uh, you know, what kind of uh, planogram layout you, your store should have, what kind of uh, products you should have, you know, at the beginning, etc. So that is also something we help with. We have a platform which helps retailers experiment, right? And, you know, I, I think that the general uh, agreement here is that we do a lot of experiment, we learn over the years, right? And that's where, you know, MasterCard is able to help retailers that if you're investing X, rather than investing the whole amount, invest a smaller amount, test it out, and if it works, then ex expand, rather than going deep dive and then, you know, rolling back uh, in many of the cases. So that's, that's uh, been helpful, yeah. Very helpful. Uh, data is the new gold, right? So <laughs> I think if you have the data and if you use it properly, I think it uh, helps inform a lot of decisions. Kamal, coming to you, I think you, uh, you have created a very interesting brand. And uh, you know, how do you think about store location, store footprint in the context of your brand, in the context of your target consumers, their journeys? So, and you, we've heard the panelists speak a lot. So we'd love to so, hear. So honestly, I'm a little depressed <laughs> because I think I uh, haven't learned anything and I still need to learn a lot because I still have a lot of FOMO. Wherever we don't have stores, we want to be there. I still want to be on the ground floor in every mall, whether we should be there or not. But uh, on a lighter note, I'm saying that the thing is that, uh, like uh, uh, Subhash uh, said, that there's no thumb rule, I think, that works for every brand. Uh, everyone has made some points, and all of them are, are coming from deep experience. So like Manish said, it's about location, it's about adjacency, it's about both. I think it's, it's, uh, it's different for different brands in different cities and uh, different with, when it comes to a mall, different when it comes to a high street because in a mall, being in a uh, zone which is uh, adjacent to other similar brands, I believe is far more important than being on a high street. But all of that uh, as it may be, I think uh, the three most important things still remain location because as long as you're in the right location and there is footfall for uh, the kind of brand that you are, uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, I'm Kamal Kushlani from Mufti, for those who didn't know. 
we are a casual wear brand for men only uh, in the mid premium to uh, premium uh, category so wherever there is a footfall whether it's at the airport whether it's in a mall whether it's in a you know neighborhood uh, no, neighborhood uh, uh, what do you say retail uh, high street or it's in a in a main high street of a town or wherever it is that you know there is a footfall for this kind of consumer seeking uh, products in the mid premium to premium uh, casual wear range we have to be present because uh, i mean and we are still learning every day there is no such thing that is perfect uh, we've been to high streets we've made all kinds of mistakes and yes we've had stores which we have moved just uh, you know 50 100 meters away and we've seen you know 3x uh, sales coming out of the same store with the same mix and even a smaller size at times so there's uh, i mean just a few basic things that uh, i think one has to follow is uh, location is number 1 number 2 is uh, we always calibrate our growth through the profitability lens so whatever you do or one does has to see that whether it's going to add to your bottom line or not of course there are certain places like i said we also have fomo where we must be present uh, because there is a demand for those things there but it's it varies from city to city it's so surprising uh, you know i'll give one uh, example uh, there's a small town in up called gonda and you know there's uh, i mean as we move into i mean we are present across all types of towns whether it's a metro tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 so this is a very very small town and my ex driver happened to hail from there and one of the franchisees came up to us and said that i'd like to open your store here and uh, you know we are very very reluctant where you know being a first mover into certain markets etc because as i said we are in the mid premium to premium price range so being a first in that area there's a typical way in which we have seen uh, markets develop and india develop and smaller towns develop but in this town we didn't have an uh, we didn't have a precedent we didn't have a multi brand outlet because coexistence of multi brand outlet and our ebo we have seen better demand and traction for the brand in such places and typically it starts from an mbo then you know the uh, the uh, city or town becomes conducive for single brand retail and then of course towns grow horizontally and there are more and more stores that come up in those towns however we didn't have any uh, store in this town we didn't have an mbo in this town we had an mbo somewhere further away which wasn't doing that well but this guy was very confident and he wanted to you know open a store with us we had the uh, panel discussion with him there's a committee who discussed with the franchisee and kind of told him and forewarned him that you know we are not very sure of being able to uh, succeed in that market and he was very confident and we opened a store and in the first year itself in that small town we clocked a sale of 1 crore so there are so many surprises that keep coming up and there are other towns where there are you know established uh, high street markets and we went there due to fomo but yeah we didn't uh, get what we wanted to get so this is uh, you know this this is going to be there i think it's a continuous cycle we will keep uh, opening stores and the the key is to, you know getting it right doing as much of a you know deep dive as we can and being realistic in assumptions that we make when we open the store because that is what is going to uh, ensure that you know the the ratio of closures versus the rate at which we open stores uh, is is very very low otherwise you're just going to have to close a lot of stores so there's tremendous amount of learning yeah, uh, i can add I yeah can. sure go for it uh, and kamal uh, talked about profitability right and i think from the beginning we have been talking about opening stores or closing the ones which are not working but how do you know that and that's something which retailers have come back to us saying okay if i have a store in bombay versus a tier 3 town what should be the ideal revenue that i should be expecting what are my competitors uh, you know looking at it you know how much are my competitors making versus myself right so that is a benchmark that we do help uh, as well uh, and which comes from the you know kind of um spends that we see across different consumers so that gets a profitability ratio and which helps in optimizing the existing stores as well and uh, i'm going to have lunch with you yeah <laughs> and kamal i think uh, what you said resonated a lot because if i uh, think about 
developed markets versus a market like India where categories are still shaping up, consumer behaviors are still shaping up, there's a lot more space and requirement for still having that entrepreneurial view of with the data, you may have category spends, you may have competitor spends, all of those are inputs. And I think there is a, uh, there is a much higher proportion of entrepreneurial uh, instinct based test and learn that can I take a, the, the degree rate of experimentation has to be much higher for brands in India to succeed compared to the standard playbooks that may exist in many more Western markets. And, I, and this is true across categories. I've seen this, uh, you know, these kinds of surprises. Uh, and Subhash, you talked about it brilliantly, right? I mean, you open a store and then you're suddenly across the road and next door it, uh, it runs. The maths often may not tell you that it will work, but actually, you know, it does work. And that's uh, what's important is as the next generation of professionals take over and as the brand scale, how do you not lose that? And because after a certain network, then the rules start to play and then that entrepreneurial, uh, you know, instinct of store role, role, uh, role or start. Yeah. <laughs> no, and they have to go by the rules, right? I'm, no, uh, I'm a professional and there is, I would play by the rules to a great extent. So there is always a, what's the right balance in a way that over we are building brands that last decades and networks that are actually getting built over a period of time. So Deepak, you don't want to add something? Yeah, yeah, what I wanted to say is, you know, we generally talk about success of a particular store which happened and which was out of gut. We don't talk about a lot of failures. Yeah. So for sure, we should talk about, you know, data analysis before opening, because if we start talking about failures, there'll be many more. But we generally talk about one of success and that should not be the parameter. Yeah. Data analytics does play. It cannot be gut feel or intuition which makes you successful. One out of ten is not a success. That's a great point. I, I, uh, I think one great best practice I've seen, which I'm sure all of you would also be following, is have a. This is the hypothesis. This is the PNL that I'm going in with. You know, chal jayega versus this one will make you know uh, this much revenue at this cost. That is my promise. If it goes better, great. If it's doing Worse than that, then I know that this is what my expectation was and this is what it, uh, it's doing. So, uh, I'll just add a little. How we have kind of uh, insulated ourselves uh, to, you know, uh, ensure that we make minimum number of mistakes. It's about being, at the end of the day, the, the brand or the company gets run by professionals. You can't be doing everything on your own, though ours too is a family-owned, family-run business. Uh, today we are listed, of course. But uh, it's still run by the family and the team that helps me run it. Uh, I think it's the clarity that professionals need as to what are the company goals and how we do it. See, typically in a lot of companies, the BD team, as we call it, the business development yeah. team that expands stores is separate from the sales team. However, for us, it's part of the sales team. And the person who proposes the store to us, to the committee, is the person who proposes what sale it will do. And he's committed to a certain OPEX. And everyone in the entire company is incentivized by only one common goal, which is profitable growth of the company. Okay. Otherwise, what starts happening is that the BD person has a target of opening 50 stores or 100 stores. So he has to open that. Somebody else has to run it. And the guy who has to run it is not committed to the store that was opened by someone else. So. For professionals, I believe as long as they have clarity on what is the go company goal or the brand goal, I think the mistakes can be minimized. There's That's great characterization no cover. I've seen the BD team saying, my job was to open stores. I've done it. Now your problem. <laughs> yeah, it's different channels also. I mean, <laughs> even in B uh, if that's BD, there's BD on all fronts because that's a multi-channel business. Correct. There's um, MBOs uh, running parallelly with EBOs. So both should not cannibalize each other beyond a certain extent. You have to be able to get the optimum output from a market where you're present. Makes sense, makes sense. Thank you. Avnish, would love to hear your, uh, you know, from your perspective, first I uh, would request you to share a little bit about your uh, business with the audience and then, you know, on the conversation that the panel has had so far, your views on 
store locations, how you think about it, any learnings that you would like to share? So I'm more on the controversial side of the apparel business. So we deal with a lot of uh, women ethnic wear and we deal in a lot of occasion wear. So when it comes to weddings, I think everybody has spoken much about the uh, size of the stores, location of the stores. But you know, when you talk about ethnic wear, especially for women category, we are very limited to the locations that we have. So you know, every city has its own Probably everybody sitting here has a family member who's used to going to that one street in that particular state or a city and going shopping for ethnic wear because you know your mom or your wife or somebody in the family has been going there for ages and you kind of have a trust on that because you're eventually buying ethnic wear is also emotionally driven. <clears throat> but you know, parallelly to come point by point, I think uh, in expansion spree, how Manish said, for store rollouts, I think we go for a thing called speed for process. But I think technically, speed for process, I think for a lot of people has not been the key because eventually it is the other way around. If you have the right process, then speed comes to you when you're expanding your brand. So uh, likewise with Neeru's, when we started expanding, in fact, we were one of the first organized um, women ethnic wear brand in the country where we do all kind of formats from high streets to malls to LFS, working with a lot of shop and shop brands, organized retailers. So we are almost there uh, with about 52 uh, uh, EBO stores and about 140 point of sales with the LFS formats and we sell everything from a 500 rupee kurti to a 5 lakh rupee lenga. Technically sounding that it's impossible but we have stores ranging from say a 1000 square foot store to a 30,000 square foot store. So we have a flagship store in Hyderabad which is uh, probably a 30,000 square feet store uh, on a flip side, we also have a store in Santa Cruz on SV Road, which is just about 1,000 square feet. And uh, the kind of average bill value that we do there is about 25,000. And uh, what we do with malls, with the large format store, is just 1,200. So we are working across categories and trying to cater everything under the portfolio of ethnic wear. But I think post-COVID, <clears throat> a lot of changes happened in the scenario where women started liking experience. So the stores had to be bigger. The stores had to talk the language of today. They were digitally very inclined. They, every day you wake up, I think probably see a lot of influencers digitally, let it be Instagram, Facebook, or any other media that is available. So everybody wants to look like that Deepika or Alia Bhatt on that Friday morning picture that releases and everybody is accustomed to uh, looking at those influencers who are telling you to wear what's the trend of today. So to keep up with the whole logic, so we had to undergo a lot of shift. So we kind of uh, uh, resized our stores. Of course, there was a lot of shutting down of stores, opening stores against that. But the major trick was to resize the stores, come up with more 3, 4,000 uh, from a 2, 3,000 to a 5 to 8,000 square foot store, which gives a good facade. Probably, I think in the last one year, we've changed facade of almost 25 stores, which look similar, which give a very today's relatability, which stand out like your first point, which stands out in the clutter. So the first thing that you do is is the facade, that is your business card. That's the first thing that you do for retail. If it's location, 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 then the fourth point always is the elevation. You have a small store, big store, doesn't matter. You have to have the right facade. In fact, a couple of months ago, we opened a store in a small town in Andhra in Rajamundri, and we were quite lucky to have a 90 feet facade for a 5,000 square foot store. So that was humongous and then we came down to a BD team, everybody says I think we should give 20 feet to some other brand and just enjoy 70 and sublease and try to you know lower our rental burden over it. But somehow I was not in the notion to do that, I would have enjoyed it looked like a single screen cinema from outside but we had to go by the rules as professionally driven decisions at times work well with you and that is probably our best store for rent to sales. But the best store with the facade and best store, and it's not in Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore or anywhere, it's actually in Rajamundri. So I get, I feel good that, you know, the store of 90 feet and we are sharing it, one of the like-minded Tata complementing brands and uh, it worked out well. And on the contrary, in a mall in Hyderabad, surprisingly, five years ago, nobody was talking about it. I was just sharing the story with someone outside and where we were doing around 20 lakh a month from a 6,000 square feet. Suddenly we are doing a, a 1 crore 20 lakh per month from the same store. And uh, it was not left side, right side, up or down. It was just that the mall clicked. 
suddenly in Hyderabad and it's become the talk of the country that everybody wants to be in that mall. And I remember sitting with the promoter of the mall, very humble person from Hyderabad and he was saying that, uh, Avnish, I'm going to spend on your capex. You can't exit my mall or resize because five years ago I told him that I think chota store karna chahiye, ye both bada ho hai. So he said, no way you're going out because you're from Hyderabad and you better have a big store here and I'm going to spend on capex and trust me, he actually did that. And today we were on revenue share for that and today is enjoying more rentals because the revenue has gone 5x. So it's one of the stories that how retail is so diverse and you know I'm not from the background of western wear or something where if, you know uh, apparel in ethnic everybody likes to be at a particular street like Santa Cruz in Bombay, commercial street in ba Bangalore, maybe a Karol Bag in Delhi or a South X or you know so everywhere the, the MG Road in uh, one of the cities so it's all so diverse and everybody is used to going th to those streets but for us I think four things is, is just basic. I think we've spoken so much, but four simple things to actually look out for a store is, one is, first is the street, second is the size, third is the space, and fourth is sustain. So when you talk about street, which street, is it a future street that is going to develop in the couple of years, or is it a matured street today that you're paying a heavy rental for? Second is about size. Whether I want to do a thousand, five thousand or ten thousand square feet depends where your nearest next store is and how your uh, product category you want to diversify. Third, it's about the space, the layouting of your store. If you have the right layout, you know I'm going to you make use of every penny inside the square feet of that particular location. I think you'll do wonders if your layouting is well thought of and your high uh, revenue churning product category is given the right space in the right uh, way if you work out well with your design architects. And the last and the most important is sustain. So when I said speed for process for expansion, we often forget sustaining. So sustain becomes a bigger part because the fourth test is the first test for me because you don't have to see if you're getting into a, a rental agreement for 9 years, 12 years, 15 years, 21 years. So you have to, it's like a marriage for that next 9 years. You can't say midway after the lock-in I'm going to get away. If your BD team, yourself, everybody is so strong in your survey of the vicinity that you know you can sustain for a longer time. Don't think that my interiors are nut bolt screw, I can shift anytime, I can e exit the street anytime. That's what the mistake we oftenly make. And we tell our design architects that make an interior where if I want to finish my lock-in and move, I can do it quickly. So it's on the first day of marriage, you're telling your wife, chalega to theek hai, nahi chalega to dekh lenge. Ek saal baad, tata bhai bhai. So you, you know, that's the kind of thought process. So how uh, Mr. Kamal said that we are still very desi in the thought process, although our category is also desi. But then, you know, that is the actual way of looking at. So retail operations has different 4S when we talk about stock, sales, service and everything. But the real 4S is this for a business development point of view. Again, joking. I said, I love the analogy he drew. Bibi ko pehle din bol denge chalega to theek hai otherwise. I mean, I can take this conversation. But yeah, I think the, you know, we can keep going for a long time. This is very, very interesting, very insightful. And I, you know, at the highest level, I'm taking away a few things. Yeah, very widely varying and very useful perspectives from everyone in this panel. And I think there are, some common learnings that I think, you know, definitely I'm going to use uh, what I'm sure was useful for the audience as well. But what's also clear is that depending upon the format, the category, the new stage of development of the category of the brand, I think there are nuances that are particular to, you know, uh, to you. So I think it's the right combination. And for, for those in the audience thinking about where the next store is going to be, Take these learnings, but please apply your mind in your <laughs> brand and category as well. So, so many caveats, but yes, there is there is a science uh, and an art uh, to this. But thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, it was a very, very insightful discussion. I definitely learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone in the audience uh, did as well. So please, uh, a big hand for the panel. Thank you.